April 4th, 1932, Dick Luger is the oldest of three children for Marvin and Bertha Luger. As a fifth generation Hoosier, he grew up in Indianapolis, yet maintained a strong connection to his family's farm in southwest Marion County. The farm gave Luger one of his first lessons in the unpredictability of life when he and his brother Tom invested their hard-earned $15 in an acre of winter wheat. So we put our whole fortune in this, and uh, we were sitting there going to church one Sunday, and Dad said, I've got bad news. The flood took off the wheat field, and it's all gone. And, and so we thought that Dad uh, meant that he had had some bad luck, but he was going to give us our $15 back. But we were wrong. Uh, we, we lost the whole thing. And he said, that's the risk you take if you're a farmer. As a young man, Dick Luger understood what it meant to stick with something until success was achieved, like earning the rank of Eagle Scout. He graduated from Shortridge High School in Indianapolis at the top of his class and went on to Denison University in Ohio. Four years later, he finished at the top of his class again. While at Denison, he also met the love of his life, his senior class co-president, Charlene Smeltzer. As a Denison student, Luger earned a Rhodes Scholarship and following his college graduation, set sail for Pembroke College, Oxford. When I was a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University, I heard others discussing the fact that military service ought not to be for them, that uh, they were very able people, and it would be a tragedy if they were to lose their lives or even lose their time in military service. Uh, I became more and more disturbed by those conversations. I felt they were inappropriate for people to whom much has been given. And they really impelled my decision not even to wait until I came back to the United States, but to go to the American Embassy while I was there and to volunteer for the United States Navy. As it, it happened, why Admiral Burke, who was in the Chief Naval Operations, found four young people. I was one of them fortunate enough to be a briefer and in due course, this led me to be at his side during the Lebanese crisis and the Taiwan Straits crisis and uh, to watch power being exercised by a master. He was a mentor for me with regard to how America as a world power makes a difference. Marvin Luger ran the family business until his untimely death in 1956. Luger and his brother Tom returned to Indianapolis upon completion of their military service continued their father's work and strengthened the foundations of their machine manufacturing company and the family farm. It was a situation in which we opened up the plant gates in the morning and, and closed them at night, turned the lights on and off. But we did everything. There wasn't anybody else. The fact is there aren't streams of accountants and attorneys and managers. You, you do it yourself or it doesn't happen. It was my role in 1961 to pass out the paychecks, and I did that every week. Uh, because we had a weekly payroll and it was by hand and I gave the check to each employee, which meant I heard a lot about those employees and their families. Luger's talents were soon noticed by his neighbors and his sense of duty beckoned. 
people came to me uh, on the west side of Indianapolis, asked me to run for the school board in uh, 1963. And Char and I talked a lot about this, our obligation. And um, conscience made me do it. Once on the school board, Luger went to work. And here, the children obviously needed school breakfasts and school lunches. There was a federal program that would help provide that. I felt we ought to go for it. It was, a, as I recall, a four to three vote, but uh, we did go for it. And that was the very first federal aid to enter Indianapolis. Luger's desire for an improved system didn't stop with the school lunch program. We were on the cusp of a civil rights revolution, certainly an educational system that had great problems. It was racially segregated and furthermore, economically segregated in many ways. I tried to bring about something called the Short Reach Plan, which provided for my own former high school, now 90% African-American, 10% Caucasian, to become an entry point for everybody in the city who wanted to go to college. And it would be a free choice to desegregate a large high school and then sort of move on other ways. And it happened. The first class was almost 50% African-American, 50% Caucasian. It didn't happen elsewhere ever in America. It was like water running uphill in terms of popular view. But it was too good to be true. Uh, the rest of the board decided that uh, Luger was too involved in sociology, in race, and worries about this. Luger's plan would be reversed after just one year, and his election to the presidency of the school board challenged. I lost the school board presidency four to three in 1966, and I still remember it vividly because I was so passionately involved in that situation. Following his defeat for school board president, Luger prepared to return to the factory and farm. But his community needed his services again. In 1967, at age 35, he was elected mayor of Indianapolis over long political odds. He was characterized as the Boy Scout mayor, and he was heading into one of the toughest times American cities would face. A police officer came in to tell me that there was a report that Dr. Martin Luther King had been shot in Memphis. Through my mind went all the events already of that day, namely that the Kennedy campaign was determined to come to Indianapolis, to 17th and Broadway. A, a, a dangerous area in terms just simply of turmoil and crime, quite apart from racial dislocation at that point. What we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another. Robert Kennedy gave a magnificent speech, which is still shown, and rightly so, as one of the high moments of oratory in our country, and likewise, poetic idealism. Indianapolis did not blow up, and it was not to say that, we didn't ha that it wasn't a very difficult time for everybody. It literally was going into church basements and street corners and reporting to the people uh, night by night and trying to take every step I could uh, to uh, listen to take actions that were appropriate, to try to do a lot in a short time, which might have been done for years before, in terms of reconciliation and understanding of need and aspiration. Dick was always there, always visible, uh, never worried about his own safety, just wanted to reassure people that everything was being done, that we cared, that there were going to be brighter days ahead. Those uh, were critical moments. But nevertheless, uh, Indianapolis had a peaceful passage. Not only did Indianapolis come through the civil rights movement without the scars of so many American cities, Luger led a community resurgence in the capital city. A key component to that rebirth was a government reorganization plan he championed called UNIGOV. That was an experiment that said that, that a city can remain whole that it can have a vital center as well as vital neighborhoods and suburbs, as opposed to being a hollowed out shell like so many cities were and have become. So I, th these were radical 
in a conservative mode. With UNIGOV signed into law, Indianapolis was set on a path of uninterrupted economic growth. Following eight years as mayor of a major American city, Luger was once again called to serve. This former naval officer, school board member, mayor, farmer, business owner, husband, and father took his experiences to the United States Senate, where even more challenges would await. After arriving in the Senate, it wasn't long before Senator Luger would have a major impact on national legislation. The issue on the Chrysler legislation was how much money will be required uh, for Chrysler to work its way out of losses and potential bankruptcy. In 1979, Luger joined with Democrat Paul Songus to devise and pass a one and a half billion dollar loan package for Chrysler that protected tens of thousands of jobs while ensuring the federal treasury and taxpayers were paid back in full. I was involved to make certain the fabric of Newcastle, Kokomo, Michigan City, parts of Indianapolis and so forth that somehow came through. During Luger's tenure in the Senate, he would also become a leader in agriculture, health and fitness, and education. He won a seat on the Senate Agriculture Committee and soon became a spokesman for market-oriented farm programs and expanding agricultural exports. He sponsored the Landmark Conservation Reserve Program, the largest tree planting program in American history. The program conserved soil on 36 million acres of farmland, cleaned streams, and restored wildlife habitat. I rise today to declare that the time has come for a thorough review of the United States Department of Agriculture and for fashioning a plan for trimming the ballooning waistline of this one government department back to a leaner, healthier size. He prevailed against political resistance to pass a bill downsizing the overgrown bureaucracy of the Agriculture Department. Now this meeting of the uh, Senate Agriculture Committee is called order. This morning I will propose modifications to the chairman's mark. In 1995, Dick Luger became chairman of the Agriculture Committee and was a force behind the revolutionary Freedom to Farm Bill. He authored groundbreaking legislation that advanced biofuel research, established testing of agricultural pesticides, and improved transparency of commodity markets. Dick Luger also established himself as a leading congressional advocate for the expansion of medical research, the prevention of birth defects, and the promotion of rural and community health centers. Called one of America's fittest senators, Luger has been an outspoken advocate for healthy lifestyles. Beginning in 1979, he sponsored the Dick Luger Fitness Festival in Indianapolis, and it continues to this day. For his legislative accomplishments, in 1991, Dick Luger became only the fourth member of Congress to receive the prestigious Outstanding Legislator Award from the American Political Science Association. Throughout his Senate career, Dick Luger has drawn on his experiences as a school board member to advance education. He led efforts to support comprehensive school reform programs, early reading initiatives, and student nutrition programs. It is this committee's responsibility to target our resources to ensure that our nation's children have access to a nutritious diet. Even as Luger worked in the Senate to expand educational opportunities, he personally established in the 1980s a college scholarship program for Hoosier minority students that continues to reward academic achievement. I 
appreciate so much his dedication to excellence in education and all the sacrifices that he has made to make sure that minorities would not just finish high school but go on to uh, secondary education. I would just say thank you, Senator Luger. As Senator Luger continued to make a mark in domestic policy, Senate Foreign Relations Committee is now called to order. His career saw a meteoric rise to the chairmanship of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 1985. And from your opening statement, Mr. Chairman, I think you were counseling that this is what we need. He was widely credited with reinvigorating the committee and with being a stalwart advocate for the advancement of democracy around the world. This is the first such comprehensive review of American foreign policy since the late Henry Jackson convened hearings in 1961 entitled Organizing for National Security. At President Reagan's request, he led the American delegation to the Philippines for the critical 1986 election between President Ferdinand Marcos and Corazon Aquino. When the vote count showed Marcos winning the election, the Reagan administration initially sided with the Marcos camp. But Dick Luger saw what was really happening on the ground. He understood that the election was being stolen by Marcos. There was a rejection of President Marcos in that election. And even if people did not know Mrs. Aquino well, they knew President Marcos very well. And they decided they did not want him to continue. Following the election, Luger returned to Washington and set about to convince President Reagan of the fraud and abuse committed by Marcos. He succeeded, and the United States changed course, recognized Aquino's victory, and helped preserve the integrity of democracy. I have been getting support from your government officials, and um, now we will be trying to uh, encourage private investors to come to the Philippines. We turn to the issue of South Africa where President Ronald Reagan's adamant opposition to sanctions seemingly runs against the sentiment of bipartisan majorities in Congress. Moreover, action. The Senate was debating whether to impose sanctions on the government of South Africa, which had long enforced apartheid. ...to enjoy basic human rights. Repression and violence are increasing. Large segments of South Africa's black community have come to believe that international sanctions may be the only way to force change. The government of South Africa repressed the nation's black majority and jailed many opposition leaders, including Nelson Mandela. We are dealing with a tragic situation in which hope could be given to blacks in South Africa that we care, that the world cared. The Reagan administration opposed the sanctions package. Senator Luger worked behind the scenes to change the president's mind, but when the president vetoed the sanctions bill, Luger led the Senate effort for a rare veto override. We are against tyranny, and tyranny is in South Africa. And we must be vigorous in that fight. Mr. President, tragically, our influence may be so limited that the government of South Africa will pursue headlong a course bound to lead to destruction of that government. We're not destroying the government. That government is self-destructing. The American people felt very strongly that narrow sanctions on the leadership of South Africa might lead to freedom for Nelson Mandela and certainly put the United States on the right side of history. We simply must overcome our divisions on this issue in the Congress if we are to assist in the development of peaceful and fundamental change in Nicaragua. Following his first chairmanship of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, Dick Luger remained a leading voice in foreign affairs. 
He worked successfully for Senate ratification of the INF and START arms control treaties, which banned intermediate range nuclear weapons in Europe and dramatically cut the nuclear arsenals of the Soviet Union and United States. Uh, we have, in fact, as a nation, negotiated a good treaty. Uh, any subject dealing with um, foreign relations uh, or arms control, there's always one person we turn to, and that's Richard Lugar. In 1997, the Chemical Weapons Convention was threatened with obstructionist tactics. Luger rallied a majority of Republicans to join behind the treaty, which required the elimination of poison gas stockpiles and established strict inspection procedures. Though many commentators had written off the treaty just weeks before, it passed the Senate by a three to one margin and Luger won widespread praise for his efforts. It seems like every time this country has been at a crossroads, the right people have been in place in elective office. Dick Luger is the right person at the right time. And as Joe Biden said so eloquently, what Dick Luger was able to do from the very beginning, working through these issues, paying the respect to colleagues on both sides of the aisle, is a real tribute to him and to the leadership that we know he holds. This hearing of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is called to order. In 2003, Luger returned to the chairmanship of the Foreign Relations Committee with the energy and insight that had been the hallmark of his first chairmanship. During four years as chairman, the Foreign Relations Committee held more hearings and confirmed more nominees than any other committee in the Senate. He held more than 30 hearings scrutinizing the war and reconstruction efforts in Iraq. He shepherded treaties through the Senate to downsize nuclear arsenals and fight cybercrime, corruption, and international crime syndicates. He forged and passed bipartisan bills to strengthen U.S. nuclear cooperation with India and bolster accountability at the multinational development banks. During this period, Dick Luger became only the second U.S. legislator ever accorded the honor of addressing the U.N. Security Council. As in previous administrations, he again served as a go-to diplomat for the United States. In 2004, President George W. Bush called on Dick Luger to represent him in observing the critical elections in Ukraine. After conducting surprise inspections of vote counting facilities and polling places, he helped forge a consensus among international election observers that there was fraud and abuse directed towards opposition leader Viktor Yushchenko. The result? A fair democratic revote that saw Yushchenko win in a culmination of the so called Orange Revolution. President Bush also sent Luger to North Africa to help facilitate the release of 404 Moroccan prisoners of war being held in neighboring Algeria. The humanitarian mission to free the longest held POWs in the world was a rare opportunity for the United States to successfully mediate a lingering dispute between Muslim nations. Few American legislators have played such a large role in the diplomatic history of the nation and over such an extended period of time. Dick Luger has earned my personal respect, a man of matchless honesty and integrity and perhaps the Senate's leading intellect. He took on some of the toughest assignments we had and he was there with solid advice whenever I needed it. He is a great Hoosier and a great American. With more than 30 years of experience, Luger's voice on foreign policy continues to be respected. Standing before the Brandenburg Gate, Every man is a German, separated from his fellow men. Every man is a Berliner, 
forced to look upon a scar. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. The world rejoiced when the Cold War ended. But even as the United States looked forward to a peace dividend, Dick Luger saw that the Cold War victory had left in its wake one of the most dangerous security issues of modern time. President Reagan named me and a few others to go over to Geneva, Switzerland, to monitor arms control talks. At the time that Gorbachev came to power, it looked like something might move. So nothing moved for quite a while, but we met a lot of Russians. And in the course of that, when the Soviet Union blew apart, some of these Russians came to visit us. The Soviet Union's economy was in tatters, and its military was in disarray. Russia and the other nations emerging from the former Soviet Union held tens of thousands of nuclear warheads, millions of chemical weapons, and vast quantities of deadly pathogens. Many stored in dilapidated facilities defended by troops who did not know when their next paycheck was coming. The breakdown of the totalitarian state means that renegade soldiers could cart the stuff off. Luger recognized that strong leadership was urgently needed to prevent a proliferation disaster. The Russians came to me and said, we have several thousand nuclear warheads aimed at you. You've spent $6 trillion in the Cold War trying to defend yourselves. The question is, what will you do now? Working with Senator Sam Nunn, a Democrat from Georgia, the pair proposed a radical idea. The United States would offer funding and expertise to the nations of the former Soviet Union to help safeguard and destroy their weapons of mass destruction. But this proposal was a hard sell. The administration of George H.W. Bush gave no support to the idea, and Congress had little enthusiasm for assisting America's former enemies. Against the odds, Luger and Nunn went to work to convince a skeptical Congress. That is an ICBM with one warhead. That we're trying to use the Nunn-Luger funding to achieve... They succeeded in passing Nunn-Luger by an 86 to 8 vote in the Senate, an outcome that Congressional Quarterly called a remarkable last-minute turnaround. One of the first successes of Nunn-Luger was the elimination of nuclear weapons from three nations. We've got everything out of Ukraine, Kazakhstan, Belarus, and they have no nuclear weapons now. Understanding the dangers posed by weapons proliferation, Luger sought the nomination for president in 1995. He campaigned on preventing weapons of mass destruction from falling into the hands of terrorists. One of the most grave foreign policy dilemmas we have is the intersection of materials left over from the Cold War, nuclear, biological, chemical, and terrorists who want to buy these materials and who have their agendas, which include the blowing up of buildings and people, as well as trying to make uh, their viewpoints known in bizarre and dramatic ways. We have to gain control of these materials. He did not receive the nomination. Six years later, the September 11th attacks magnified the risk of failing to secure nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons. And a decade of non luger accomplishments resonated with politicians and citizens who had never before thought about the issue. Understanding the importance of the issue, Luger continued his work and pressed on to secure weapons of mass destruction. Every year, he travels to the former Soviet Union to encourage cooperation, oversee the destruction of weapon systems, and inspect defenses at Russian weapon sites. I remember one time being asked to go up to Sevmash to see six Typhoon submarines. I was the first American to go up to that base, which had been super secret. Typhoon submarines had 200 nuclear weapons each. They were up and down our Atlantic coast for about 15 years with just a chip shot into New York City or Washington that could have destroyed everybody. Thank goodness they didn't fire them, and thank goodness now they were asking me to help destroy them.
Our generation dove under deaths because we were afraid of potential nuclear annihilation. And that's why I'm active. That's why I want to continue to be active, because I can make a difference in that world. For their efforts, Luger and Nunn have been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize every year since 2000. Now we have a unique opportunity with the window of history open just a crack to destroy those warheads and destroy those missiles. In 2003, Senator Luger passed a bill extending Nunn Luger beyond the former Soviet Union. I was called by the Albanian government they had chemical weapons above Tirana, their capital, up in the mountains. I went to an Air Force plane over there with military personnel and their military people, and indeed there were drums sitting around of chemical weapons, which somebody could have picked up if they'd have known what they were seeing. And so we quickly got them all into a fairly small space and a fence around them. But a real problem, how do you get rid of this stuff? In 2006, Luger partnered with Senator Barack Obama of Illinois to pass legislation applying the concepts of Nunn Luger to conventional arms stockpiles around the world. The problem still is proliferation of any of these materials, nuclear or chemical or biological, to other countries, often in small amounts. But the fact is that some of these items have spread elsewhere and in quantities that uh, could be decisive in terrorist attacks or in horrible things that could occur. The Wall Street Journal called Nunn Luger one of the most prescient pieces of legislation ever enacted. This is crucial work. This is not simply uh, some type of enthusiasm for foreign policy. This is the security of our country. Such foresight has been a hallmark of Dick Luger's career. In naming Luger the Senate's wise man in 2006, Time magazine asserted Luger's thinking has often proved to be ahead of the curve. From the Shortridge Plan in Unigo to the Conservation Reserve Program, the South African sanctions debate, and none Luger, Senator Luger has had the vision and will to build for the future. Since the Industrial Revolution, access to energy has been indispensable to ensuring a country's national security and its capacity for economic growth. In the late 1970s, an energy crisis severely disrupted the economic activity of the United States. As a freshman senator, Dick Luger put his skills to work in analyzing the problem and solutions. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have tried to summarize as best I can in a homemade document the fact that the Congressional Budget Office estimates that if current trends continue, 22.8 uh, million barrels of oil will be imported in the United States each day in 1985. This leaves finally a gap at the bottom of the page, we estimate, of 3.2 million barrels that are, are not accounted for by imports not accounted for by production in this country, simply not accounted for at all. And that is if all of the Carter program, all of it, is adopted. Luger saw the national security risk and energy crisis placed on the United States, and he moved to strengthen the domestic sources of energy. The country is going to pay a fearsome price for energy if we don't uh, encourage our domestic producers. Gasification of coal, all of the whole raft of the solar energy projects or thermal energy or wind projects, gas a haul, all sorts of things become feasible if the federal government is not playing against change by deliberate manipulation of the price of the current fuels. We will find ourselves even more vulnerable to OPEC blackmail. American concerns about energy ebbed and flowed with the prices, but Senator Luger remained a staunch advocate for energy security. Because we fought a war, Desert Storm, in which we sent 500,000 Americans. Why are 500,000 Americans going to Kuwait? 
Jim Baker, our Secretary of State, replied, maybe at a very candid moment, and he said, oil, oil. In 1996, Luger wrote in the Chicago Tribune that, surely we understand that our Persian Gulf oil dependence remains a great strategic and economic vulnerability. In 1999, with gas prices at just a dollar a gallon, Luger joined with former CIA director James Woolsey and penned a seminal article outlining the severe national security risks of U.S. energy dependence and proposed an urgent national program to speed emerging biofuel technologies. Luger went on to introduce and pass the Biomass Research and Development Act, aimed at accelerating biofuel development. Tensions in the Middle East and hurricane damage on the United States Gulf Coast brought the public's attention back to the issue. If you've not made the experiments, not made the investments early on, there are going to be shortages of power, downtime, in which we don't have air conditioning, we don't have lights. Now, this may sound far-fetched, but it's very close. Profound implications. In 2005 and 2006, Luger held eight hearings on the subject and offered legislation that would make alternative fuels available to Americans on an unprecedented scale in an effort to forestall a widespread energy crisis. I've offered and gotten into the bill a mandate that eight billion gallons of ethanol must be produced in this country by 2012. Why eight billion? Because it's a big figure. It means you've got to make changes to get eight billion gallons produced and that'll be the law. As they do it, there will be a distribution system. There will be a reduction in price. There will be re-engineering of automobiles. There will be a lot of things that, as a matter of fact, bring us closer to energy independence. As the demand for energy increased, Luger gave a speech in 2006 in which he called for a new realism in the energy field that recognizes the need for urgent action to deal with this national vulnerability. Tom Friedman of the New York Times called it one of the best speeches I have ever read about the necessity of breaking America's oil addiction. Drop what you are doing and read it. Today, Dick Luger continues to be at the leading edge of the energy debate. Senator Luger pays attention globally, nationally, statewide, but he cares about individuals too. People who are hungry are every bit as important to him as world leaders. 30 years after leaving the Indianapolis Public School Board, Dick Luger would again be called upon to ensure hungry, needy students would have access to food. In 1995, some members of Congress proposed that Perhaps we should not do school lunches on a national basis, but rather we should let states or maybe even local governments pick up the slack. Suggesting that after all states' rights ought to prevail, if federalism is a principle meant if a state wanted to have a school lunch program, they ought to have one or a city, but if they didn't, why they wouldn't? And uh, I argued that uh, a child cannot dictate where he or she is going to be born or live or how many times transferred and a child ought not to be deprived of a learning opportunity because no school breakfast, school lunch programs are there in that particular location. In other words, we are one nation. We have a national obligation to our children, at least at the nutritional level. Each one should have a chance to eat and to learn. And so I argue we're going to have a national school lunch program. Uh, obviously, not everybody agreed with that. It was not a popular idea. <laughs> Dollars are always tight in Washington and everywhere. We're all running our programs under budgets. It was an easy thing that could have been done to save money. He gets it. He knows how important it is that those kids get fed. Finally, it came down to the fact that both houses of Congress had passed legislation to end the whole thing, but my signature was required on the conference report. They could not get to a majority without that, and I refused to sign. Senator Luger stepped up to the plate and said, this is not the right thing to do for children in Indiana and across the United States. We need to make sure we have funding for our kids to eat meals every day in the schools. 
Luger's passion for feeding the hungry isn't limited to school lunches. About 10% of American families have food shortage at some point. That means millions of children sometimes do not have food in this country. They obtain it through food banks. We are so lucky to have Senator Luger in Indiana. He's been a good friend to the hungry of Indiana and, and the nation. Luger's food bank legislation demonstrates not only his understanding of the hunger issue, but his desire to go beyond rhetoric and find intelligent solutions to complex problems. I've offered legislation that would give incentives for farmers, ranchers, restauranters, corporations to give food to food banks. The Good Samaritan Anti-Hunger Tax Relief Act has become a hallmark Luger achievement. Luger has also been a staunch advocate for health and nutrition programs overseas. In the Senate, Luger was the leading force behind the African Growth and Opportunity Act. The bill embraces the vast potential among 48 African countries and nearly 700 million people and links the United States more closely with that continent. He led the successful campaign to pass the landmark Global AIDS Bill. Through hearings, he highlighted the devastating effect of AIDS on women and children. Luger has won praise for his efforts to fight AIDS and help the world's poor. He authored and passed legislation giving assistance to orphans and needy children in developing countries. Luger's support for vaccines to deadly diseases such as malaria and AIDS continues his efforts to save the lives of millions. Always seemed to me very important if you were sensitive to things that were going on around you, problems of human need, that you needed to do your duty. That there are occasions when you lead and the following is not necessarily constant, may not be successful, and the consequences of failing to bring off that successor are very substantial. A gentle, thoughtful, persuasive, persistent, but wise course of action as a winner. a strong sense of connection to his home state of Indiana. His 604-acre corn, soybean, and tree farm cements that bond. My dad purchased the farm that we have now in Marion County. Uh, this was his pride and joy, and he got help from his dad to buy it. I love farming because it makes a difference in my life with really the, the lifestyle of people who grew up on farms, as I had the opportunity to do as, as a part of my boyhood, uh, made a big difference in terms of my growth and the people that I was around. The walnuts are not uh, tolerant of competition. The get the weeds down, get the repeating bushes out of the way, and of course at this stage to do the pruning. I, I keep the books, I make the crop plan, I try to understand what it may take in terms of new yields, new research, new methods, new marketing plans to make that farm go. This is a, a farm that I love. It's a farm I hope to pass along to my four sons and their children. Um, we're farmers. My soul is right there on that farm. Through his life, Dick Luger would find himself with Queens, presidents, and even the Pope. His travels across the globe have afforded him many insights, including a simple basic truth. Indiana is home. <laughs> 